Good evening. This is Jeff Greenewalt, your friendly railroad tycoon and chair of the History Consortium. And welcome to another one of our programs for Historic Railroads Week. Tonight, we've got a special treat. We've got the Adams County Historical Society and a program about the restoration of America's train stations. And two of the members of the Adams County Historical Society, Howard Burrell and Antigone Ladd, will be the presenters this evening. And so let's uh, let the Adams County Historical Society take it away. My grandfather, his name was also Howard. Uh, he worked on the Pennsylvania Railroad. And that's sort of my connection to railroads. I took an interest in, in his work. Uh, although I never met him, he passed away before I was born. I learned from my mother a lot of the things that he did as a brakeman on the Pennsylvania Railroad. Here's a slide I'd like to show you of my grandfather who's standing in the middle between the engineer and the, the brakeman. My grandfather was a fireman on this locomotive. This is the train crew. The man on the far left is my uh, grandfather's brother. This train was stationed in Pittsburgh on the Pennsylvania Railroad. It is a locomotive manufactured in Altoona, Pennsylvania. And uh, this slide is from the early 1920s. The locomotive was a coal burner. It had a top speed of 17 miles an hour, and it would run at that speed for one hour, but it would take six tons of coal to, to make that train go at 17 miles an hour for one hour. So that's a fascinating history of the trains that uh, I've carried with me all my life. I never got to meet my grandfather because he passed away before I was born, but my mother told me the stories that he told her of the of the railroad, and that, that got my interest in, in railroads. And... Uh, Coming to Adams County to live, there's a tremendous railroad history here, and I want to talk a little bit about that in this program. Today, we're going to be talking about Gettysburg Adams County train stations. Pictured is the uh, Lincoln train station in downtown Gettysburg on Carlisle Street. Uh, we'll be talking about that station and many others. Um, we hope you enjoy the photographs that we are going to show you and some of the stories that we'll be telling you. Before we get into the train stations themselves, I want to talk about the fact that railroads became an important part of American history. In the late 18th and early 19th century, if you wanted to travel more than a few miles from your home, you were restricted by rivers and uh, trails and primitive roads. And if you were close enough to a a town that was on a waterway, you could travel by canals. But there was very little opportunity to travel inland uh, if you lived in the interior or if you lived in extremely rural areas. There was a need to travel and explore beyond one's place of origin. Uh, people were just curious and wanted to go beyond what they could reach within a, a few hours of walking or riding a horse. People needed to connect with people far away from their place of origin. And as the nation grew, there was a need to sell goods beyond where they were grown or produced. And there was a need in the late uh, 18th and early 19th century to unite a growing nation. It was railroads that fulfilled those needs. Early beginnings of railroads came out of towns that uh, would use uh, a coach drawn by a horse on tracks that often were made of wood, sometimes made of iron as time went by. Uh, the idea came up that we should connect towns by rail, find a means of getting from place to place without having a horse pull a bunch of people in a railroad car. So in February of 1827, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad became the first United States railway chartered for commercial transport of passengers and freight. As you can see in this picture, picture of the locomotive, which they called Tom Thumb by Peter Cooper. Um, this was the first uh, commercial locomotive attached to a, a, a train that was actually going from one part of the city of Baltimore. And they envisioned actually going to Ohio from Baltimore by, by rail. Of course, that dream had to wait a few years and, and for the development of the locomotive. One person from our area in Adams County was Thaddeus Stevens, who wanted to produce a railroad to go from Gettysburg towards Maryland and down to the Potomac River where there was a canal. 
Daddy Stevens was born in Vermont in 1792. wasn't from Gettysburg or Adams County originally, but he moved to Gettysburg as a young man and opened a law practice in town in 1816. He had many business ventures. He was an entrepreneur for sure, and uh, not just a lawyer. And in 1839, he became financially involved in the proposed Gettysburg Railroad. 1839, railroads were uh, coming into their own, and Thaddeus Stevens wanted to be a part of it, and he envisioned a railroad going west out of Gettysburg. And they proposed a Gettysburg Railroad in 1839 that would run from Gettysburg, as you can see on the right side of your screen, all the way over to Maryland. And this particular drawing shows it uh, terminating near Clear Springs, Maryland, and the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal on the Potomac River. A lot of mountains had to be crossed, as you can see at the bottom of this map, the elevations from Gettysburg all the way to the terminus included going across some mountains. To get across the mountains, they didn't dig tunnels, but they would do switchbacks. This became known as the Tapeworm Railroad by its critics because it had so many switchbacks on it, it looked like uh, apparently a tapeworm to them. Construction began, but it was never completed. The Commonwealth of Pennsylvania uh, provided right-of-ways for the Tapeworm Railroad, and they were later used by the Susquehanna, Gettysburg, and Potomac Railroad, and also by the Baltimore and Harrisburg Railway. They were used later to build a line from Gettysburg to Highfield, Maryland. But because of so many switchbacks on this proposed 1839 Gettysburg Railroad, you had to travel 35 miles to go a distance of just 18 miles. They realized it was an engineering feat that would be very costly. And so Thaddeus Stevens and his friends ran out of money and ran out of political support. And this particular railroad was never built. Early independent railroads such as these and the right-of-ways that they produced were uh, eventually all absorbed by the Western Maryland Railroad by 1917. The Gettysburg Railroad Station was built in 1851, um, or rather it was conceived in 1851, when three local Gettysburg businessmen, Robert McCurdy and Josiah Benner and Henry Myers, obtained a charter from the Commonwealth to create the Gettysburg Railroad Company. And they didn't go west with their line, they went east. They went east from Gettysburg to Hanover Junction in York County, a distance of about 29 miles. And uh, the charter in 1851 enabled them to obtain right-of-ways and travel that distance, putting in the rails, completed in 1859. And this is what the railroad station looked like. It was completed in 1859. And uh, in May, a two-story station in, the Get in Gettysburg opened. And when this station, which is still there today, of course, and when it opened, it had a cupola and a new brass bell on top to announce the arrivals and departures of, uh, of trains. And now, just four years later, after this station was built, the Battle of Gettysburg took place and raged all around it. The town was, of course, taken over by the Confederates, but the building remained unharmed and served as a Confederate hospital. The rail line was out of service, however, just out of town a short a distance out of town when Confederates, the Confederates of Jubal Early's division burned the railroad bridge over Rock Creek. And this is uh, just on the outside of town where Route 30 crosses on the York Road. Route 30 crosses the Rock Creek. While the bridge was burning, the Confederates put 17 railroad freight cars into the burning bridge. Uh, it, it was said to be quite a conflagration. Uh, but it didn't take long for uh, the bridge to be rebuilt and function again after the battle. And the station was then used to bring supplies into Gettysburg by the uh, Christian Commission and the Sanitary Commission and to move wounded soldiers out. It became a very important transportation hub in Gettysburg, of course. This is an interesting slide to me. It shows the Gettysburg train station in the background with the cupola and the brass bell hanging in it. Uh, a late uh, 19th century photograph, not dated. But the train crew uh, posing for their picture uh, with what a locomotive that would be typical of the time. The train carried both freight and passengers, and you can see some freight being loaded onto the 
a freight car right behind the, the tender and the uh, passenger cars behind that uh, that would unload at the train station. Uh, but it's a it's a great picture of a, a 19th century locomotive and the and the crew that ran it. At the train station, Abraham Lincoln arrived, of course, in the November of 1863 to deliver some appropriate remarks at the dedication of the Soldiers National Cemetery. He arrived at the train station, and we know the story of him uh, delivering the Gettysburg Address and departing the next day from the train station. However, there were no photographs of him uh, either at the train station and one that was taken from a distance at the uh, National Cemetery, taken by, an, uh, I believe, an assistant of Matthew Brady, because Matthew Brady at the time was in New York, I believe. Here's a picture of the train station today. Just a few years ago, it was uh, repainted to its original color and uh, it still proudly stands as uh, a beautiful monument to the era and a, a great attraction for the city of Gettys uh, Gettysburg. The actual ownership of the station transferred to the borough of Gettysburg in 1998 from a, a railroad company that no longer wanted to run it. And in 2013, the Gettysburg Foundation purchased it from the borough. And in 2014, the United States Congress legislated a declaration that the train station uh, would be within the boundary of the Gettysburg National Park. So that made it a possession of the uh, National Park Service. But today, the Gettysburg Foundation operates, owns and operates the station as a national historic site. The railroad tracks that run beside it are the CSX tracks. Uh, CSX is the, one of the largest uh, railroad uh, corporations in the east of the Mississippi, and it has 21,000 miles of track, uh, a pair of which runs right through Gettysburg. I want to move now to uh, the railroads of Adams County. The slide we have here is a railroad map of Adams County uh, drawn in 1895. And as you can see, the main lines run from Gettysburg north, and that's the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad tracks. And you can see this the stops on this track. Um, <clears throat> Goldenville, Table Rock, Biglerville, Sunnyside, and Bendersville, and so on, Gardeners, Aspers, um, all the way through to the northern part of the county. And then this track, which runs east and west, actually southwest, east to Gettysburg, and then further east to Hanover Junction in York County, uh, is owned and was owned and operated in 1895 by the Western Maryland uh, Railroad. <clears throat> Notice this little spur here. Uh, in 1895, the Gettysburg-Harrisburg Railroad had a spur that ran from Gettysburg out to Little Round Top. It was an excursion uh, line. But notice all the little railroad stations all along these tracks. It actually connected the county uh, east and west and north and south to Gettysburg. Um, down in this area, no railroads. Um, it was uh, important so Gettysburg could connect from near the center of the county uh, to the other uh, counties uh, nearby. The new Oxford station, however, had a different fate. It is still there, and it's today a, a railroad museum. It is a very significant uh, railroad station in the terms of uh, Adams County history. Uh, it was built in 1892 by the Western Maryland Railroad. Uh, and if you go into uh, New Oxford today, as you go uh, across uh, the railroad tracks, before you get into town, if you're traveling from Gettysburg, you'll see a little red caboose uh, right beside this station, and you'll see the station completely restored to a beautiful train museum. So it's a great place to stop by and learn more about the local trains here in uh, Adams County. We're glad that's been preserved the way it is. I want to move on now to Hanover Junction. And even though Hanover Junction is across the Adams County border in York County, it has significant historical ties to Adams County. Now, first of all, I want to point out that this is uh, this is the uh, Hanover Junction Station, um, and it has a, a picture of a locomotive and its crew, and some little kids there off to the left, and some young fellows sitting on the cow catcher of the uh, locomotive. And this locomotive is what's known as a camelback locomotive. Uh, camelback locomotive is uh, 
so designated because it has the drive cab astride the boiler. And this photo is undated probably mid to later 19th century. These types of locomotives were very popular in the mid 19th century, uh, but it made it very difficult for the engineer to look back at the train because of the position of the cab. But here's a little more information about <clears throat> the Hanover Junction train station. You can see the tracks uh, connecting to different railroads. And this particular junction is where Abraham Lincoln stopped on the 18th of November, 1863, to come uh, to Gettysburg to deliver his uh, address at the dedication of the Soldiers National Cemetery. Now, this photograph was taken by assistance of Matthew Brady. As I said earlier, he was probably in New York at the time, and he didn't attend the ceremonies for the dedication himself, but he sent two assistants. And these photographers went to Hanover Junction the day before. As you can see on the platform, there's a lot of people. Speculation has it that these people were waiting for a train to transfer to Gettysburg and then stay overnight in Gettysburg for the festivities of the dedication of the uh, Soldiers National Cemetery. Some 20,000 people attended that dedication. And of course, all the ones from out, out of town, 99% of them probably arrived by train. This particular engine is also a camelback engine. And you can see two men standing on top of it. And there's a very curious type of uh, event that occurred there that was photographed. And I want to show it to you in this next slide. This particular photograph is one of great controversy over the years. As we know, Lincoln transferred trains at Hanover Junction, or at least was on a train that uh, had to switch over to a new locomotive. And we're not sure whether or not he got off the train. Some say he did and some say he didn't. But this photograph has always been cause for speculation. As you see in the center, there's a tall man with a stovepipe hat and a beard. Uh, people say that's Abraham Lincoln. Well, there's no proof that there is. No proof exists, rather, that this is Abraham Lincoln. But it's, a, it's always fun to have Lincoln sightings in photographs from um, 1863. And this was taken at Hanover Junction on, on November 18th, 1863, just one day before the dedication of the cemetery. Again, more people standing on the platform waiting for a train and uh, the tall man with a stovepipe hat and a beard. Could it be Abraham Lincoln? Some say yes, some say no. There's no sure way to tell, but it's always fun to speculate. This is the Hanover Junction today. As you can see, it uh, looks very similar to the way it did back in 1863. It was built uh, between 1852 and 1854. It's currently preserved as a museum, thankfully. It's still there. And it's a rest stop on the York County Heritage Rail Trail. So if you want to ride a bicycle or hike the rail trail you have a you can stop at hanover junction uh, just like abraham lincoln now we have a, a second train station built in gettysburg and this was built later in the 19th century in 1884. this was built by a competitor a railroad company the gettysburg harrisburg railroad built this station and it is still there today at the corner of West Washington and North Railroad Streets, about a block and a half from the Lincoln train station, which is, of course is uh, several decades older. This railroad was taken over by the Reading Railroad in 1891 and later by, again, the Western Maryland Railroad, which uh, took up many of these smaller stations and railroads in Adams County. We could do a whole program on just what the older railroads were and their acquisitions and mergers. Uh, it's a very long and uh, storied history. But this railroad station was a very, very active station, and it was in existence uh, in 1884, and it was used for the 50th anniversary a celebration of the Battle of Gettysburg and also the uh, 75th anniversary. Um, and you can see the sign, hard to read, but it says Gettysburg-Harrisburg Railroad. On the, on the sign, and it is still there today. Here's another photograph of it. This particular railroad station was used uh, well into the 20th century by excursion trains. You could 
get on a train at this station. You could go north to the northern part of the county, get off the train, have dinner, get back on again, and come back to Gettysburg. And these excursion trains ran all the way into the 1990s out of this particular station. And there you see an old locomotive, probably early 20th century, uh, would be my guess for this picture. This railroad station, uh, when the railroad, of course, uh, went out, the station was converted into a restaurant. The first restaurant there was the Whistle Stop. And when it went out of business, Tommy Cranius uh, took over and uh, he opened his first pizza shop in Gettysburg, Tommy's Pizza. His, his uncle was Ernie. Uh, Ernie brought Tommy to the United States and uh, Ernie's Texas lunch is a still um, going concern here in Gettysburg. And Tommy's Pizza and Ernie's Texas lunch is run by the grandsons of these gentlemen. But the railroad station was the first place that uh, Tommy opened his pizza shop. And you can even see in the left-hand corner there a little bit, he had outdoor seating. So he was quite an entrepreneur himself. My name is Antigone Ladd. And like Howard, I have a love of railroads going back to childhood. In fact, some of my fondest memories are sitting in the dark in the summertime with all the windows open listening to the trains roll through town late at night. I love the sound of the railroads and I love traveling on railroads. So it's been a fun trip for me to look at the rail industry as Howard traced it from its growth period to the changes that came. And that's what I'm going to investigate in this next segment. From 1895, where he pictured here, you saw that little towns all along the rail lines sported their own train stations. Here are a few of them that we have labeled for you. Biglerville, Bendersville, East Berlin, Peach Glen, Gardners, McKnightstown, Ortana, Littlestown, Fairfield. Let's take a look at what will happen to these stations and to the businesses as the rail industry declines. Until about World War II, the railroads will continue to grow, but then in the 50s, we start a sharp decline. Why? Because of the automobile, for one. The automobile is now available to individuals. Interstate highways make traveling much easier. The airline industry is booming, and the trucking business using those interstate highways is carrying a huge amount of freight. Add that to the increased regulation, and you can see why rail service is on a downward spiral. Now let's look at these same stations that I had pictured earlier. Howard mentioned that New Oxford, Gettysburg, and Hanover Junction kept their train stations. They renovated them, but other stations throughout the county did not fare as well. Some of these buildings that you see pictured here were sold, they became retail businesses, or even private homes. Others were abandoned and torn down. So now let's look at what it would take to turn around that decline. And let's look at some spectacular success stories. Let's start with this magnificent building that was completed in 1914. It was built by a company made up of the 12 railroads that served Kansas City. When it opened, Union Station in Kansas City was the third largest train station in the country. But by the end of World War II, station traffic had peaked and train travel declined. The station ended up closing in 1985. Then in 1996, a public-private partnership began a $250 million restoration, funded in part by a sales tax levied in both Kansas and Missouri. I have visited this facility, and it is amazing today. Let me show you what it looks like. Today, Kansas City Union Station provides not only transportation, but also serves as a destination in itself. People come here to go to the theaters, to the Interactive Science Museum, the Planetarium, 
the Irish Museum and Cultural Center, the Center for Dance and Creativity, as well as restaurants, shops, and event spaces. In addition to all those activities available, it's a fully operating train station. Here's another success story and one that I have visited and fallen in love with. The Cheyenne, Wyoming Depot is the last of the grand 19th century depots on the Transcontinental Railroad line. It was a strategic point along the Union Pacific Railroad and was easily the railroad's most grandiose facility west of its starting point. This was the first large scale federally sanctioned construction in the aftermath of the Civil War, and it opened the West to a new kind of travel. It was completed in 1886. When my husband and I visited there, we were amazed because it's so conveniently located in the downtown area and it faces right onto the state capitol building. Now it's been named a National Historic Landmark. And it tells the story of not only the railroads, but of the city itself. And it houses, for those of you who are railroad buffs, a world-class model railroad layout on the top floor. If you look on this photograph, this section that sticks, juts out from the back of the building is a lounge with floor to ceiling windows, all glass around it, leather sofas, and it hangs out over the rail lines, and you can sit there and watch the trains come in and out. The depot is also a major part of the Cheyenne community in terms of annual planning and events. Here's the street side of the Cheyenne Depot. You were looking at the rail side before. This is during frontier days. As you can see, it's right in the center of the celebration. Now this beautiful collection of buildings is located in the Mojave Desert. Not only is it a working Amtrak station, but Barstow Harvey House also is home to two museums, the Barstow Chamber of Commerce, and city offices. Travelers and architecture lovers will appreciate the grandeur of this 1911 station with its colonnades, its arcades, domed towers, and clay tile roof. And here's the inside of the Harvey House. When it was originally designed in 1911, it was one of a network of restaurant hotels that were built and operated by the Fred Harvey Company, hence the name, and that was done in conjunction with the Santa Fe Railroad. Does this look like a library to you? Because it is one. And I know that we have several librarians who are part of our Historic Railroad Week planning team. So for those of you who love libraries, feast your eyes on this one. The Middletown Station was part of the New York, Lake Erie, and Western Railroad. And it was first built in 1843. Not this building because after 50 plus years of service, the original building was replaced by this one, which was built in 1896. So it's still over 100 years old. This particular building served as a railroad station until 1983. Then when rail service was taken over by other providers, the depot was renovated and restored, and it's now called the Thrall Library as of 1995. Denver's first train station was constructed in 1868 to serve the Denver Pacific Railway, which connected Denver to the main transcontinental line at Cheyenne, Wyoming. But by 1875, there was so much traffic and there were four different train stations in town making passenger transfers between the different rail lines pretty inconvenient. So to remedy this issue, the Union Pacific Railroad proposed, let's create one central station to combine all the various operations. And they did. So in 1880, the owners of the four lines, that was the Union Pacific, the Denver and Rio Grande, the Denver, South Park and Pacific, 
and the Colorado Central all agreed to build a new station at 17th and Wincoop Streets. Today, Union Station is the central transportation hub in Denver. This facility includes the historic terminal building, a train shed, a 22-gate underground bus facility, and a light rail station. In 2012, the station underwent a major renovation, transforming it into the centerpiece of a new transit-oriented mixed-use development. When the station house reopened in the summer of 2014, it included a 112-room hotel, several restaurants, retailers, and a train hall. Let's take a look at this. This is what a food court should look like. Not a bad place to stop for a quick meal. If you should be lucky enough to travel through Marshall, Texas, you would be welcomed by this beautiful red brick building edged with white trim and surrounded by a huge and comfortable looking porch. This is the sole surviving building out of 57 that once made up the Texas and Pacific Railway complex. This beautiful station is still staffed by ticket agents seven days a week. So maybe you would be interested in visiting Marshall, Texas. Now here is a fascinating transformation of a train station in Scranton, Pennsylvania. This is now part of the National Park Service. Steamtown National Historic Site is a railroad museum and Heritage Railroad. It's located right in downtown Scranton, PA, at the site of the former yards of the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Railroad. It has both a technology museum and a history museum and has a 62-acre site. Most of the steam locomotives and other railroad equipment at Steamtown were originally collected by one man, Nelson Blount, a millionaire seafood processor from New England. However, in 1995, the National Park Service acquired Steamtown USA and improved the facilities at a total cost of $66 million. Here you see a park ranger giving a tour. And here's a view of the outside of Steamtown, giving you a sense of the size of this site. The museum is built around a working turntable and a roundhouse, and it has the original outbuildings dating from 1899. All the buildings on the site are listed with the National Register of Historic Places. Quite an operation. Now here's a building that is not yet completed, but I think that is an important part of our story. It can be done. This train station is designed to help Detroit get back on track. The Michigan Central Station was once the tallest train station in the world. Then when Detroit fell on hard times, so did its train hub. The building stood vacant for 30 years, and then Ford Motor Company bought it in 2018. So you can see this is a new renovation. Ford announced that it planned to restore the station building and turn it into a technology hub, and that was designed to bring innovation and jobs back to the city. But there was massive work to do. In the 30 years it had sat vacant, the building suffered immense water damage, and it had to be stabilized. It needed complete electrical work and mechanical work, plus restoration of the outside. But Ford kept its promise, and even through the pandemic, they kept the construction going. It's expected to be finished either late 2022 or early the following year. The station is intended to be part of Ford's new Cork House campus. That's about seven miles from the Dearborn headquarters, and it's going to include a 30-acre walkable community surrounding the train station. So this will be the center of a big community. And Ford is going to turn the train depot into its electric vehicle team production area. 
Now here is another work in progress, one that I visited twice this year and was absolutely amazed by this setting. Do you believe that glass ceiling? This is Moynihan Train Hall. It's not a new station. It is an annex to the existing Pennsylvania station. It is next door to the original train station, and it's not replacing it. It is adding space because, believe it or not, Penn Station got so much business it couldn't handle it all. Penn Station and now the new Moynihan Train Hall serve both Amtrak and the Long Island Railroad. Now, where did this building come from? It was originally the city's main post office building. It's located right in Midtown Manhattan. It covers 486,000 square feet and was designed to alleviate congestion because in New York City, they saw 650,000 riders daily before the COVID pandemic hit. This is just an inside view. If you look to the left where you see the blue, that's the main hall. This is the waiting area where you can sit if you have your ticket. There are plenty of monitors around giving you the schedules. And believe it or not, a real person comes around and announces your train and what platform it's boarding from and assists you to get over there. This is the kind of service we would all like to have. Beautiful job. Now here is my all-time favorite train station, probably because I've spent so much time there. When I worked in Washington, D.C., we not only ate there at the multiple restaurants, we had meetings there, we entertained guests, we gave tours of the building. It is so beautiful and so big, there is always something going on there. Now this station has undergone numerous uh, renovations. In fact, Oh, I don't remember the year, probably in the 50s or 60s, there was a major crash where a train lost its brakes and crashed into the building and ran into the basement area. It's still a working train station and a busy one. I have friends who love Orioles baseball, and they would take the train from work. They park the cars there. There's a big parking area. They would take the train to Baltimore get out and go center city to center city, watch the game, come back, pick up their cars, and be home in no time. The retail stores in the station are worth a visit all in themselves. They're amazing. If you look at this picture, all around where you see the doors, there are additional rooms. There are shops and restaurants there. Up on the second floor where you see the statues and the glass, there is a balcony area, and there is another floor there. There is plenty of shopping to do there as well. So it abounds in space. The restaurants are amazing. There are sit-down restaurants with table service on the first floor and on the second level. In the basement is a food court that is massive. Also in the basement, you have several movie theaters which I remember very fondly. They are actually carved out of the stone that is down at the basement level. They're small movie theaters, but on opening night of the movie theaters, the American Film Institute brought in black and white movies, all with railroad themes, and you got to pick which one you wanted. I think I saw Marlena Dietrich in Shanghai Express. And the attire for the evening was black or white or black and white. And people came in the most outrageous outfits. So there's always something to do at Union Station. If you look at the um, centerpiece, the circular thing with stairs that appears to be on legs, that is actually a restaurant right in the middle. This building is used frequently for inaugural balls. But I want to show you something fun that happened in Union Station that gives you an idea of how successful a spot like this can be. And what an asset a train station like this in the center of the city can be to everybody around. Let me give you the setting. It's Christmas 2015. 
People are racing in and out of the building. They are shopping, they are dragging suitcases, they are making reservations. And in the center, near that round uh, restaurant that I pointed out, there's a guy with a drum set setting up on a very small platform and a bunch of guys in US Air Force uniforms and a piano is rolled in. But what happens in Washington? You pay no attention, you just keep on going. And let me show you what happened. Now, isn't that quite a show? Well, I have to tell you, with my love of World War II music, attire, and history, and my love of railroads, this has to be one of my all-time favorite performances. If you want to see the entire video, there are several versions up on YouTube. Just type in Union Station World War II Dancing, or type in U.S. Air Force Band, and you'll, you'll find it a number of ways. It's easy to find anytime you have a bad day. This is what you need. Now I'd like to turn the program back over to Howard, who has studied Gettysburg's long involvement with railroads and who is bringing us right back to Gettysburg. Not only did the rail service contribute to the economic growth of all of Adams County, but it played a very special role in our history. You all know about the many presidents who have visited Gettysburg. Did you know that many of them got here by train? Woodrow Wilson, Teddy Roosevelt, Calvin Coolidge, Franklin Roosevelt. We know about the presidents, but now let's look at the average soldier. Howard is now going to show you photos of the Civil War veterans reunions, the 50th and the 75th, that took place here in Gettysburg and the veterans came by train, thousands and thousands of them. And I think that's a lovely way to bring us back from the growth of railroads to the important part they play in our history. In 1913 came the 50th reunion of the Battle of Gettysburg. And here we have a picture again from the archives of the Adams County Historical Society. The veterans trained arriving at Gettysburg. Uh, notice the uh, the, the veterans in the windows, looking out the windows, and uh, some of them down the line waving. Uh, I often thought when I looked at this picture, uh, how these men who fought in the Civil War 
saw the evolution of the railroad from uh, a primitive uh, steam locomotives to uh, to that time in 1913, more modern, uh, technologically advanced uh, rail cars, as you can see them uh, connected with, uh, looks like they might even have some air brakes on them at that particular time, I'm not sure. But uh, uh, these men saw the evolution of transportation in terms of the railroads, as many people who were born in the early part of the 20th century could see the evolution of uh, air travel from uh, primitive airplanes up to uh, supersonic jumbo jets. So these gentlemen on the train saw quite a bit of, of evolution. And here they are arriving in Gettysburg for the observance of the 50th reunion of the Battle of Gettysburg. <clears throat> these men are getting off the train at the, uh, at the depot, uh, Lincoln train station. And uh, the celebration went from June 29th to July the 4th, 1913. And there were 53,407 veterans of the Civil War attending. Now, of course, they all didn't fight at, the, at Gettysburg, but this reunion was open to any veteran of the Civil War. And of that 53,400, 8,750 of them were Confederate veterans. So you had these men coming back together, some of them meeting soldiers from the opposite side for the first time in their lives. But there you can see quite a few of them uh, detraining and coming to Gettysburg for this a spectacular 50th anniversary. And the speaker, featured speaker for the 50th anniversary was President Woodrow Wilson. Um, he was arriving by train and he spoke on July 4th, 1913, to the largest gathering of Civil War veterans um, yet to, to, up to that particular time. You can see him here uh, with uh, some uh, gentlemen that accompanied him by train. And here we have now, veterans after the celebration and after the reunion are getting back on the train to go home. Many of these men were in their 70s at this time, late 60s, uh, early 70s, uh, but they were determined to come to Gettysburg to to uh, meet with their fellow veterans and, uh, and mark the occasion. And uh, it's great to have these photographs of them uh, at this particular point, getting back on the train in order to go home again. And many of them would never, never return, but uh, they were here for at least the 50th anniversary to commemorate uh, the event. We now have the 75th reunion of the Battle of Gettysburg. And in 1938, we have President Franklin D. Roosevelt arriving at the train station uh, in Gettysburg. You see around him uh, Secret Service agents. They're well-dressed and trying to look inconspicuous, obviously but uh, not succeeding at that. But at least they're guarding the president as he arrives, departed the train, and uh, got on his uh, way to uh, to the festivities. Now, I don't believe President Roosevelt stayed in Gettysburg. I believe he stayed in Artsville for the dedication of the Peace Light Memorial and to address the veterans who were gathered. The uh, next slide shows some uh, police cadets and wheelchairs because they're here to await the veterans. There were 25 veterans of the Battle of Gettysburg that attended 75 years after the battle. Just 25 of them were well enough to attend, but there were also 1,359 other Union veterans and 486 Confederate veterans attended the 75th reunion. And the average age for these gentlemen was 94. And here we see one of those veterans with his wife, this is veteran Austin Cutler, age 92, and his wife, Maud. Um, they are arriving from Indiana to attend the festivities. Uh, local Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts aided the veterans during their stay, and, and there are a few of those Scouts that are still living in Gettysburg today. They're in their 90s. They remember these veterans, remember talking to them. I've had the privilege to talk to a couple of those Scouts, uh, both Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, and it's a, it's a real honor and privilege to talk to them because they actually talked to the veterans. Uh, some of them were of the Battle of Gettysburg. And here we have another veteran arriving for the last great Civil War reunion at Gettysburg in 1938. Fascinating photograph. And here we have another slide of the veterans arriving for the 75th anniversary. Notice the wooden ramp that they built. So these 
gentlemen could walk up the ramp and some of them couldn't do steps. As I said, the average age was 94. Uh, one gentleman claimed to be over 100 years old. And now if we skip ahead to 1976, you see the American Freedom Train. This American Freedom Train traveled the United States for the bicentennial uh, of independence of the United States. And they uh, came to Gettysburg on July 4th, 1976. And there's the train station, as you can see, to the upper left. Notice how long the, the train was. It had 10 display cars that visitors could enter and see some historical artifacts of the United States, including an actual copy of the U.S. Constitution that was owned by President George Washington. It had the original uh, 1803 documents from the Louisiana Purchase, and it also had a piece of moon rock that was brought back uh, in 1969 from the moon. So the American Freedom Train had quite a bit of history surrounding it. We could go on and on with many more pictures shared from the archives of the Adams County Historical Society. The Society has a valuable, uh, priceless collection of photographs and stories and artifacts from hundreds of years of Adams County history. And more and more of these uh, photographs uh, that get turned into the uh, society are, are cataloged and uh, made available to, to everyone and preserved for posterity. There are lots more railroad pictures, station pictures, but I don't have time to, to go through all of them. But we hope that this uh, brief overview would whet your appetite for more uh, knowledge about the railroads. We have one last slide. I thought this was a great, a great picture from the Historical Society's collection. We have an unknown veteran waving a last farewell as he leaves Gettysburg for the final time. Uh, he was uh, represents a, a soldier of the Civil War. Uh, following him, there were uh, the train stations uh, saw soldiers depart for World War One and and up to 1942, uh, World War Two as well. The last passenger left the Gettysburg Lincoln train station in 1942, and no more passengers arrived or departed since 1942 at that station. But this gentleman is waving to us as he says his last farewell to Gettysburg. I want to thank you for watching and encourage you to visit the Adams County Historical Society online at this web address that you see here. And browse for yourself over 20,000 photos and records, much more of Adams County history yet to be explored. Thank you.